The gift. Everybody say the gift. The gift of God is life mm, that will never stop rolling and ruling over sin. The, you didn't hear what I said. The gift of God is life that cannot be extinguished. No amount of your failure, no amount of your bad deeds, no amount of your ridiculous performance can overtake the unstoppable life of God as long as you and I are not trusting in our works or our performance, but trusting in the finished work of Jesus. Internationally recognized for teaching and preaching the uncompromised Word of God, Bishop Clarence E. McClendon answers the prophetic and apostolic call upon his life by ministering the healing grace and miracle anointing of Jesus Christ around the world. By his preaching and teaching the uncompromised gospel of Jesus Christ, Bishop McClendon the teacher, the preacher, the apostle, and an anointed prophet sent to the nations, being used by the power of the Holy Spirit, has led to the healing and deliverance of millions around the world during his healing crusades and conferences. If you want to experience another level of worship, witness the healing power of Jesus, learn the uncompromised Word of God, confirmed by notable miracles, then we invite you to partake in the overwhelming power of the Holy Spirit by the moving of God's transforming grace. I want you to open with me in your Bibles to the Gospel as John records it, chapter number four. The Gospel as it is recorded by John, chapter number four. And I'm going to continue the uh, series of messages, the theme of messages that I have been directed by the Spirit of the Lord to share on turning our eyes to the harvest. I have, I have said, thank you, I have said by the Spirit of the Lord that I believe with all of my heart that in this hour, the Spirit of God is turning the eyes and the hearts of those of his sons and daughters that are listening, him, listening to him toward the harvest as we approach the end of the age, as we approach the coming of the Lord. I believe that the Spirit of grace is turning the heart and the eyes of his church toward the harvest. And it is, that, it is in that uh, spirit that I believe the Lord has given me to share these messages. So I want to look again at John chapter 4, verse number 1. I'm going to begin reading there. And it says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. The King James says he must needs go through Samaria. Now, it doesn't tell us in the natural why, but uh, there was a reason that the Spirit of God led Jesus through Samaria. We'll find out a little more about that as we read. It says, so he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, a city, rather, of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied from his journey. Everybody say, Jesus, Jesus. being wearied from his journey. Being wearied from his journey. Yeah, Jesus being wearied from his journey sat at the well. So I want you to get in your mind that you're looking here at a picture of a fatigued Jesus a fatigued body of Christ. He is at this time the body of the anointing, the body of the anointed one. And so he is a type, if you will, of the church. It says, Jesus being wearied from his journey sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, 
ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. I want to stop right here because I want to remind you the Bible says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. I want you to remind you also the scripture says that Jesus was weary and sat by the well. And when this woman comes to him, Jesus is the one who initiates the conversation with her. In most cases, people came to Jesus, they asked him for something, or they came to receive something. But in this case, Jesus is the one who initiates the conversation. That's important because once again, the Bible said he needed to go through Samaria. The Bible also said he was weary and sat by the well. And while he is weary and sitting by the well, the rest of his disciples go to get something to eat. Now watch this. Verse 9, the woman of Samaria comes to him after Jesus has spoken. She says, how is it that you, verse 9, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So Jesus had every reason not to initiate this conversation. He had every reason not to speak to this woman, and yet he does. Look at verse number 10. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it was, or who it is who says to you, give me a drink. You would have asked him, and we, he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his flock. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him. Everybody say, will become in him. Notice she says, it will become in him, which doesn't mean it is immediately. Now it's there, but he says, if you learn how to function in it, learn how to flow in it, it will become in you a well of water or a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life or springing up into Ioneos Zoe or springing up into life that cannot be put out, life that cannot be extinguished, life uh, that cannot be overcome. And so now we get a glimpse of why Jesus went through Samaria. Now we get a glimpse of why a weary Jesus initiates a conversation with a woman that he shouldn't even be talking to. And when the conversation is engaged, when he's got her, he says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, give me a drink, uh, you would have asked him and he would give you living water. I want you to see First of all, that when the disciples come back uh, uh, to Jesus, well, let me, let, me go, let me go ahead and read because there's this interaction between Jesus and the woman. But when the disciples come back, go down to verse number 31. The, the, the interaction with the woman is important, but it's not the part of this I need you to see right now. When the disciples come back in verse 31, it says, In the meantime, his disciples came back and they urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. And Jesus said to them, I have food to eat, which you do not know of. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So Jesus has become refreshed. He has become renewed he has become invigorated because, watch this, he has done what the anointing, what the life, what the power of God is in him to do. I submit to you that one of the reasons the Spirit of God is dealing with the church now and turning our eyes to the harvest is because this artificial respiration Christianity that we have become so accustomed to where we need this and that to prop us up 
and invigorate us has actually become for many Christians a substitute to real life in the Spirit where you are and I are literally taking the power of God that has been committed to us and utilizing it for what it's there for to turn our eyes to the harvest and to reach the unreached. If we are going to be the prophetic community, if we're going to live by this word, then we've got to understand we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against powers and against principalities. This collection of powerful teachings from Bishop McClendon reveals from the word of God how believers should properly respond to social injustice. Every time God tries to bring a revival to this nation, we turn it into a political movement or an ethnic movement instead of allowing the Spirit of God to expose the injustice and falling on our knees and crying out to God to help us. Order a Righteous Riot CD collection today. Here's what I want you to focus on because this is the key of this message today. It is where Jesus in verse number 10, after he has engaged with this woman, he looks at her and says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was, who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. And when I read that here a few weeks ago, the spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, son, I want you to pay attention to this because this is the spirit, this is the attitude, this is the mindset that the church of the 21st century is going to have to have if we're going to reap the harvest. Here it is, Jesus said, if you knew the gift, you'd ask me. In other words, I wouldn't have to ask you to come to Christ. I wouldn't have to ask you to get saved. I wouldn't have to ask you to change anything about you. If you knew the gift, you'd come to me and ask me. And so when the Spirit of the Lord said that to me, I began to question, do we actually know the gift? Do, 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 we, actually, do we actually know what we're purveying? Do we actually know what it is we're carrying? Whew, do we actually know what is in us? <laughs> is it actually working for us? Does the church of the modern day know the gift it's carrying. Because Jesus said, if you knew it, you wouldn't wait for people to ask. And if, and, and if they knew what you were carrying, they'd ask you. So I wonder, does the world actually know what we're carrying? And if they don't, is it because we don't know and we're not sharing it with them the way Jesus, I want you to notice, Jesus engages with this woman who he has nothing to do with and she has nothing to do with. And in a matter of moments, if you read the rest of it, not only is her life changed, she's gone to all the people in the city and said, come see a man. Uh, what would happen if you and I began to move in the power of God to the degree that people would leave our presence and say, come see an individual who is moving in the supernatural power of God. Jesus said, if you knew the gift. He said, if you knew the gift, you would ask me. And so the Spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, son, my people need to know the gift. And then when I began to look into it and research it, here's what I found out. <laughs> that the gift, have you ever seen uh, one of those situations where somebody gives you a box and, 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 and it's a gift and then you open the, the box and there's another box? Uh, and, and then you open that box and there's another box until you get to the actual thing. Well, that's what the gift of God is like. It, it's, 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 it's a gift in a gift in another gift in another gift. And as I began to research it, what I began to understand is you and I are so gifted that if we actually knew what we had and what we were carrying, number one, we would never be ashamed to share it and people would want it and come and ask for it. You say, Bishop McClendon, 
What are you talking about? Jesus said, if you knew the gift, you would ask. So the question is, what is the gift? Well, first of all, go to Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, 23. What is it that you're packing? Uh, look at your neighbor and ask him, what is it that you're packing? Look at your other neighbor and ask him, do you know what you're packing? If you are a child of God, if you have come to Christ, if you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, you are fully loaded. You are packing every single day. You say, Bishop McClendon, what do you mean? What is the gift? And here's what I found. I found as you look at the scripture, it identifies several gifts, but they're gifts within gifts within gifts. <laughs> they, no, you didn't get what I just said. They're not different gifts. They're gifts within gifts within gifts. You say, Bishop McClendon, what are you talking about? Romans chapter 6, verse number 23. I want you to look at it and go there with me. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. Let's qualify this. Uh, sin is... Uh, is harmonia, missing the mark. Once again, it's a, an archery term. It's not a religious term. And, and death, according to the scripture, is separation from God. Again, we get that from the, from the parable of the prodigal son. When the father and he is restored and the son is restored, he said, this my son, which was dead, is now alive. So biblical death is not the cessation of existence. And see, you and I as believers need to understand that because when we tell people they are dead in trespasses and sins, or when the scripture says you're dead in trespasses and sins, people say, well, I'm not dead, I'm alive. No, no, no. According to the scripture, spiritual death, biblical death is to be separated from the power, the provision, the favor, and the goodness of the Father. So when the Bible says that you are dead in trespasses and sins, it means that Sin, not sin's individual, but the state of sin, the condition of man has separated him from the goodness, the provision, the power, the influence of the Father. So the scripture says, the wages of missing the mark is separation from God. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get what I just said? That's what that means. The wages of missing the mark, what does it mean? God has a standard. God has a standard for life. And when you and I miss the mark under the old covenant, if you miss the mark, the wages for missing the mark was separation from God. But then it says, but the gift, everybody say the gift. Yes. Say it out loud, the gift. Yes. Uh, the, the, the gratuitous endowment, the, the thing you get without paying for it, the thing that comes to you yes. that you cannot purchase yourself and do not deserve. This is grace. Yes. Undeserved fire. Everybody, everybody say it's a gift. It's a gift. No, say that out loud. It's a gift, it's a gift, which means you do not earn it. You do not work for it. Get it. The, 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 don't miss this. The wages of sin, <laughs> the paycheck for missing the mark is separation from God. But the gratuitous endowment of God, the gift of God is Ioneos Zoe, unstoppable life. The, 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 the gift of God is life that cannot be extinguished, life that cannot be put out in and or through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to notice this because in this, this scripture, number one, it, are, it, it identifies the gift, but most Christians haven't processed what this little verse means. It is powerful. I want you to notice this verse in and of itself uh, delineates and distinguishes what you and I, as new creations in Christ Jesus, are able to receive because of the finished work of Jesus over and against the old covenant and its principles and its ordinances. Notice, in the realm of the world of death, in the realm of separation from God, get it, when you are separated from God, you earn and are paid. You didn't get what I just said. I'm going to say, when you are separated, you're not listening to me. 
when you are separated from God. See, this is why the Bible says, if you knew the gift, <laughs> you'd stop trying to be better and take what I give. Because as long as you are separated from me, when you're in the realm and the world of death, you earn and you are paid wages for what you earn. The wages, the payoff, the paycheck for missing the mark is separation from God. But in the realm and the world of righteousness, <laughs> in the realm and the world of right standing and right relationship with God, watch this, you are given without earning. You didn't get what I just said. I'm going to say it again. Look at your neighbor and say, if you knew the gift. <laughs> Look at your other neighbor and say, if you knew the gift, you'd ask me. Oh, and when the church gets the message of the gift correct, people are going to come running and asking, what must I do to be saved? Get it. In the realm of the world of death or separation from God, you earn and are paid wages. But in the realm of the world of righteousness, you are given without earning. These are the two yes. systems clearly yes. juxtaposed and compared. Yes. This is an amazing statement. And while it is applied to the initial receiving of salvation, and rightly so, yet in context, it is also saying something far more powerful uh, than is usually accepted. What the Spirit of God is telling you here is having been freed from sin. Oh, don't, 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 don't miss this. Let, let, let me go up to verse number 20. Oh, don't miss what I'm about to say. It's powerful. Look at your neighbor and say, if you knew the gift. Watch this. Paul is juxtaposing the old covenant and what it did from the new covenant, what we have in Christ Jesus. Look at verse number 20. He says, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But having now been set free from sin, would you say, I have been set free, I have been set free. from sin? Say it again, I have been set free from sin. I'm talking about the gift. Say it again, I have been set free from sin. Remember, sin is missing the mark. See, in the new creation, you and I have been set free from missing the mark because we are no longer measuring our lives against the mark. We are now measuring our lives against the man. Did you hear what I just said? See, the reason, the reason you are now free from sin is not because you never do anything wrong or you never falter. The reason you are free from sin is that you've been taken out of the world of separation from God and been placed in the world of union with God. Now, you are no longer measured against a mark. You are now measured against a man. Now you are no longer measured against thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou. Now you are measured against the man, Christ Jesus, whom the Bible says is a faithful and merciful high priest. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, Woo, for us oh, in things pertaining to God. So watch what Paul says here. It's powerful. He says, that, he says in context, he's saying, having been freed from sin, we are now slaves to God in the same way that we were formerly slaves to sin. So just as when we were in sin, we were slaves to it. What does that mean? No amount of good deeds could get you out. No, you didn't. Now see, the language here is very important. He said, when you and I were in sin, in separation of God, we were slaves to it. Yeah. Meaning, no amount of good works, no amount of change of behavior, no amount could change it. Why? Because you were slaves to it. So he says, having been freed from sin, we are now slaves to God in the same way that we were formerly slaves to sin. So just as when we were in sin, no amount of good deeds could free us from sin's hold on us. Watch this. Now that we are slaves to God, no amount of bad deeds can free or release us from the righteousness of God. Did you hear what I just said? Oh, he said, just like when you were a slave to sin, no amount of good behavior, no amount of good deeds, no amount of changing your behavior could free you. You're a slave to it. 
He said, now that you're a slave to God, no amount of bad deeds, no amount of bad behavior, no amount of your failure will release you from being a slave to God if you keep on trusting in the finished work of Jesus. Oh, that's good news. I said, that's good news. I said, that's good news. The gift, everybody say the gift. The gift of God is life. Mm, that will never stop rolling and ruling over sin. The, you didn't hear what I said. The gift of God is life that cannot be extinguished. No amount of your failure, no amount of your bad deeds, no amount of your ridiculous performance can overtake the unstoppable life of God as long as you and I are not trusting in our works or our performance but trusting in the finished work of Jesus. Are you there? I said, are you there? What separates believers from the rest of the world is our faith in God. So it is important to know what God has said and how he operates based on his word. In this dynamic teaching, Bishop McClendon unlocks astounding biblical truths that will change the way you think about your salvation. When you are indoctrinated with religion, you begin to think your ceremonies make you acceptable. Your performance makes you acceptable. So I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I stay away from this, and I stay away from that, and now I am acceptable to God. No! <laughs> your ceremony, your performance can never make you acceptable to God. And when you understand how free the Son has made you, you will never again try to become acceptable to God by your performance. Be prepared to be released from years of guilt and condemnation for your mistakes and flaws. This eye-opening revelation will help you see that you were created to live free and walk free. Available now in our digital store. As new creation believers, we must learn how to work the principles of the kingdom of God to overcome life's toughest challenges. In this comprehensive teaching, Bishop McClendon explains how Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who will provide, is not only one of God's redemptive names, it is also a place Jehovah Jireh is a place. It is a name for God, but it is also a place in God. By understanding the mechanics of this principle, you will be able to tap into God's provision like never before. There are people I'm sent to that in the next 30 days or so, you are going to have an encounter with Jehovah Jireh that is going to change you, your life, and everything that comes after this forever. Don't miss this opportunity to overturn lack and frustration in your life. Download this powerful teaching from our digital store and get ready to enter the place Jehovah Jireh today.